So we are in the beginning of a brand new series this morning called Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? I'm excited to uh, kind of share. Me and Pastor Faith will be sharing again next week together. But we're going to kick off this series today. And, uh, you know, so I, there's been a lot of conversations that I've had with people where people have said something along the lines of, and you've probably heard this as well, well, I believe that Jesus was a good man. I believe that Jesus was was even sometimes, even other religions will say Jesus was a prophet. And so you, you get this kind of Jesus was a good man, Jesus was a prophet kind of a kind of a thing. But see, here's the thing. If you are a Christian, either watching this or sitting here today, then you don't believe Jesus was a good man. You believe Jesus was perfect. You believe Jesus was sinful. You don't believe he was just a valid prophet. You believe that he was God flesh that came to earth. You, you believe that Jesus came here and he died on the cross and he resurrected after three days to the newness of a life. You, you believe that he reconciled us, sinful humanity, with a holy and perfect God. That's what you believe about Jesus. So here's the question. Go ahead and put it up on the screen. Was Jesus good? Or was Jesus Was Jesus good? Or is Jesus God? You see, Jesus cannot be good if Jesus wasn't God. Let me say that again. Jesus cannot be good if He also wasn't God. He would either be, be completely insane, and we'll talk about this over the next several weeks. He'd either be completely insane or He'd be a compulsive liar. But if He's not God, then He can't be good because He claimed to be God, it says this in Matthew 16, 15, and this is the scripture. Actually, Joe even mentioned it this morning. But this is a scripture that we're going to keep on coming back to. Matthew chapter 16, verse 15 says this. It says, but what about you, he asked. Jesus is asking his disciples, who do you say that I am? And it's a question that we all, all of humanity, if you've heard of Jesus, you have to answer this question. Who do you say that Jesus is? And there were guys like, Bertrand Russell and some 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 older guys that have wrote things and said we're not even sure if Jesus was an act was 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 ever alive, but there is no modern day historian, valid historian. There's no one in modern culture would actually agree with that. It's a very very outdated statement. Jesus was a real human being, and so once you figure that out, I say who was he? I think it's a question in all questions. And here's the thing. If Jesus was God, then it changes everything. It changes our worldview. It changes how we live. It changes what it is that we do and how we do it, right? It would mean that if he's, if he's really God, then the Bible is absolute truth. And if the Bible is absolute truth, then it flies in the face of today's culture. So we better figure it out. See, our faith is determined by the answer to a couple of pivotal questions. And we're going to be talking about... Um, these over the next several weeks. So we don't really know how long this series is going to, going to last. We just say we're going to get into this issue of who is Jesus. And we'll end it whenever it ends. But how can we trust the Bible? And I think that, that, is, a, that, that is one of the most pivotal because that's where, that's where all rests. We've got to figure out, can we actually trust the scriptures? Is Jesus really the only way? Is Jesus God? Why did Jesus have to die to provide salvation? Why couldn't he have done it some other way? Okay, all, all skate. Remember that when you were a kid in the 80s? All skate. Everyone gets in the ring. Everyone can skate. It's not just the guys skate. Not just the girls skate. Everyone can skate. Why couldn't God just say, okay, I'll skate. Everyone's forgiven. Let's start over from scratch again. Why did Jesus have to die? Did Jesus actually rise from the dead? And if he actually rose from the grave, why did he stay here and leave? These are valid questions. These are questions that other people ask. These are questions that at some point in your Christianity, you should have asked. And if you haven't, then we're going to talk about it, right? <clears throat> One of the things that we have when people ask us, why do you believe in Christianity? Is we have something, something very, very valuable called a testimony. This, this, is, this, is, the, this is the thing. This, this is the thing that we can tell people. This is how Jesus has came into my life and how he's affected my life. This is what Jesus means to me and why I believe. And I've been telling stories like this. 
that I've either seen or been a part of or know someone personally. Stories of financial miracles, stories of physical miracles, life-changing stories. Stories of drug addictions that would completely vanish. Visions that people have had that have come to pass. And people then say, well, that's really great for you. But that doesn't answer all the questions that I have. And so we realize that we need something more than just our testimony. A testimony is value, but there are, there are two Greek words. One is, one is gnosis, and one is epinosis. One is head knowledge, or it's, it's, it's an intelligent comprehension of what's going on. And the other is epinosis, which is experiential, experiential knowledge. And you need to actually have both of these operational for your faith to work, right? You've got to have head knowledge, but if all you ever have is head knowledge, then you can lose your faith when a different kind of when a different kind of intelligence comes your way, because you've never experienced what it actually means. This is like a, a hands down, hand me down religion where your parents believe it or your pastor believe it or your pastor. Someone that you respected might have talked to you about it, but you never really experienced it. You just have a head knowledge of what it's all about. It's book knowledge and no application. I've seen it happen the other way too. People have just had mental assent or knowledge. What do they become? They, they become like a Pharisee. What they do is they look down their noses at everybody else because it doesn't align with the things that they see inside of the Word of God. But when we see the experiential knowledge, when we experience it, not only do we experience the words that we see on a page, but we also experience His love. We experience His mercy. We experience His grace. And that being a part of our life adds something to the head knowledge. But if all we have is just experience, if all we have is experience, then that doesn't really work either. I've known a lot of people that have said, well, this, 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 this experience and that experience have happened in my life. And because of that, this is what I believe about God. And you can say, well, what does the Word say about that? I don't know, but this is what I've experienced. This is what I've known. And you can create some very, very, um, very, very dangerous doctrines that way. Because it has to be backed by what the Word of God says. You can't have God without the Word of God. You've got to have both of them operational in your life. So I think you can lose your faith or at least express it wrongly to others if we don't have both these operational. So we're going to be talking about both, both aspects um, of this throughout the series. But this morning what I want to start off with is the foundation. I want to start off with the Word of God, the Bible. And to do that, I'm not going to be using any scripture this morning. <laughs> because I don't want to just have a certain argument where you just refer to the Bible for authenticity. You've got to go outside of that to prove how can this actually be reliable without using the scriptures. So I want to start with it. One of the things I do want to, like, what is, what is the Bible? Maybe you've thought about this in these terms. Maybe, maybe you haven't. But the Bible is a book. But not just a book. It, it, it was written over the course of 1,500 years. Like, there is no other book that we have today that was written over the course of 1,500 years. It was written by 40 different authors. 40 different authors. It's a collection of books. It's not one book. It's a collection of books. It's actually 66 different books that were written from over 40 authors over the course of 1,500 years. It was written by kings. It was written by military leaders, by peasants, by philosophers, by fishermen by tax collectors, by poets, musicians, scholars, and shepherds. It was written on three different continents and three different languages. It was written in the wilderness. It was written in prison. It was written in palaces. It was written while traveling. Over different literary styles you can find. But it's one single unfolding story about one central main character whose name is Jesus. You're not going to find, so if anything else, if someone says they, they, they want to be well-rounded, or they want, to, they, they want to know what the world has to offer them, then at least, the very, very least, you need to read a book that was written over the course of 1,500 years by 40 different authors, right? You, you need to take into account what the book actually says. You know what? I don't know what I believe about it. Maybe you're here this morning or watching online this morning. I don't know what I believe about this book. But you owe it to yourself if you're going to be an intellectual human being to read because there's no other book in all of history that equates to it there is no other book described to you it's the only one ever written of its kind people say 
It's just a book. Among other books, and it isn't as good as other books. It's full of contradictions and these stories and all these imaginations and legends. How can people say that this book changed my life? Why does a third of the population believe that God sent his son Jesus and he's the savior of the world? People are staking their whole eternity on this claim inside this book. Are we that sad of a people? Or is this book actually what it is? Is this book actually the word of God? You owe it to yourself to ask the question at least. We have something in this book called the Bible that no other religion has on its side. And that is history, events, and eyewitnesses. On our side, on the Bible's side, we have history, lots of it. <laughs> eyewitnesses. Events that have taken place and recorded in other books. Other documents outside of the Bible. So this morning what I want to do is um, I want to take into account just the Gospels. Just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I do want to I do want to kind of show this book as well. If you're interested to go in more in depth, this book is called The New Ed Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. This has been in my library for a long time. It is a it is a book that, I, I'll be honest, if you just want to put coffee table and read it for enjoyment this is probably not going to be the book it's a little bit hard to get through but this you want to take you want to take your time and actually look at all the references and read everything that it says this is this is the evidence for the bible for jesus for god for and this phenomenal work again verdict by john it's like i don't know i don't think it's a thousand pages but it's it's a lot 760 pages um and a lot of things that I'm on, this is something that i refer to on a regular basis so I would, I would um, highly suggest, if you don't have it, go out and um, start, start going through it. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing, amazing, amazing resource. But I'm just going to stick with the Gospels this morning. And here's, here's the major, major reason. We have four different counts of one man. They claim to record the events of the miracles of Jesus in the first century. If these Gospel events are true, then Jesus is who he claimed to be, which is God. If Jesus would be the Son of God because these books... Record the miracles of death and burial and resurrection of Jesus, right? If he is the son of God, then what he says about God must be true. And what the book writes about him must be true because Jesus believed in the Bible. He believed the Bible was infallible. These four different books are not just a book, but four completely individual and separate books that record the life, works, and sayings of Jesus. So I, I would just say this, and we're not going to spend the next 16 weeks talking about the reliability of Scripture and going through all the manuscripts. We're going to say this, that if, the, if those four books are true, then according to Jesus, the rest of So we're going to go with that. So we're going to go with that. And people ask me, they may have asked you, do you really believe in, like, Jonah? Like being in the, the whale for three days and not really? Like, do you believe that some guy named Moses parted the Red Sea with a stick? Come on, Sean. <laughs> do you believe that Jesus actually walked on water? Do you believe it? Do you believe it? Let, let, let stuff to believe. And uh, I'm kind of a professional Christian in some way. And I know probably more weird stuff than you can imagine about the Bible. <laughs> and I would say this, yes, I believe it. I believe every single word in it. I, I believe all of it. And here's, here's the thing, because I believe in the man that died and rose from the grave three days later. So I just choose, if I'm going to believe it, I'm going to believe the guy that rose from the dead. So two things to keep in mind. Proof versus evidence. So here's the thing that we know about things. That you cannot prove anything. In order to prove something, it's got to be what? It's got to be both observable and repeatable. You can't prove anything unless it's observable and repeatable. That's the standard is according to science, right? You can, you can repeat history. So we can't prove it, but there is something called evidence. And this is how a courtroom works. You actually don't prove anything in the court of law because you can't observe it and repeat it. What you can do is give all the evidence. And so you have this other main idea, a possibility and probability. You have all kinds of possibilities for how something 
it might have happened, but at the end of the day, it's about probability. But at the end of the day, you're going to take all the evidence in the court, and you're going to line it all up and say, well, here's all the possibilities, here's all the evidence that we've seen. And so now, what probably happened is this, and we're going to try somebody based upon what probably happened through the evidence that we see. So you can say people tomorrow, you can go to work and say, I went to venue church yesterday. And say, well, prove it. I can't prove it, but I can give you some evidence. I have a bulletin from venue church. And here's the points. Here's what Sean, here's what Pastor Sean talked about. And here's what happened at church. And hey, hey, Frank, come over here. Come here, come here, come here. Was I at church yesterday? And Frank would say, yeah, I saw you at church today. We had a conversation. We talked about whatever. And you could say, well, that doesn't prove anything. I don't believe you were there. But here's the thing. What probably happened is why would someone get a bulletin Listen to the whole message. Listen to the whole message. Four different accounts about three years of the same Jewish carpenter's life, but most likely it was probably because the events actually happened. Here's, here's something else about the scripture. There are two ways that you can look at an ancient manuscript. Go ahead and put those up. Two different ways that you can look at an ancient manuscript. Number one, you can look at the manuscript, the date and the distribution of the actual manuscript itself. And number two, you can find out who wrote it. In other words, who were they? You can find out as much as you can about the guy who wrote it. Who were they and who paid them to write this? <laughs> right? So we look back in, 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 in Roman history, for example, we have various pieces of the story, we piece them all together, we put them in history books. This is an actual excerpt from a real history book, in high school, high school history, history book. Caesar realized that he could not win power without a loyal army. So he made himself proconsul of Gaul and a region that and a region of France. In his 10 years as, as, as proconsul, Caesar brought all of, all of Gaul under Roman rule and showed his superb abilities as a military leader and, and organizer. And Caesar issued, issued written reports about what? About campaigns and victories to keep people informed. And students of Latin can still read these clearly detailed reports of what is known as the Gallic Wars. So that's something that we read, the high school students will read in history books about about Caesar. And this was, this was all, the Gallic Wars is right around about 50 AD, right around the same time as is the, the time frame of Jesus, right? Commentary Wars. So here's what we have. We have ten copies uh, of, of this document, written by a first century man, hired by the emperor. So you're looking at, we trust this guy? This guy was hired by the emperor to write about him and all of him. The emperor probably said, listen, if you make me sound like a bad guy, like I don't know what I'm doing, then you're off with your head. their leadership. The early was was taking place first century after Jesus. First century, right? It was a copy that we actually have shows up in 900 AD. Nearly 900 years after it was written, it shows up. The writings from my History 30, 30, two, two different volumes, but they were 30, 30, 30 volumes total, two volumes, 15. More of half of these have been lost. And we have two manuscripts that contain volumes. We have one manuscript, and this is again the same thing, first century. One manuscript shows up in 900 AD, another manuscript shows up in 1100 AD. You only have two. Two manuscripts. And these guys, this, this, is, this is gospel truth. You read it in our history books and we take it for what it is. This is exactly what happened, guys. And we know it because of the Gallic War. So wouldn't you expect Roman history to be something that survived? Not just not just ships. To be half of the commentaries on Gallic Wars? Why are we missing half? When you expect it, because these guys had all the money and the research to st re resources to store it, to keep them locked up, to preserve scripts. They had it was the most powerful government on the face. So here's a question: Did you expect the last one? Who's 
a Jewish carpenter from where? Galilee. Four detailed accounts about this Jewish carpenter from Galilee. Jesus, according to history, besides Christianity, he didn't read anything. He didn't write anything. Think about that. Jesus left it completely up to his disciples to do all the writing. But here's the thing. The gospel manuscripts, just Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, we have hundreds and hundreds, not just a couple. The early state to one and a fragment of the Gospel of John found talked about this distribution period. This is 135 AD, not even 100 years from when Jesus was, 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 was on this earth. And we have fragments of the Gospel of John found in Egypt. Crazy. Gospels in their entirety. We have, we have copies of all of them together by 250 AD. It, it, this is all about three years of a Jewish carpenter's life. Talk about the whole New Testament. Thousands of manuscripts. Thousands. Thousands of first and second century manuscripts. Not just a couple. So what about all the copy of a copy of a copy, all the mistakes, all the differences. These thousands of manuscripts distributed very, very quickly across the, across the known world. But here's the thing. It's hard to find these, these differences. You'll find like maybe this is a huge one, guys, that people debate. You find a, 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 a Byzantine manuscript that has the word spirit, and then a Western one that has Holy Spirit. So you leave a word out, they don't leave it out. That, that's like the most, this is very, very contested. These are the strongest cases for maybe for maybe the, by the, all the scriptures not lining up. But what, what happens, again, we, you can see this in your Bible. You can, if you want to get really technical, go get a go Greek New Testament. It'll list every single discrepancy. Like, they're not hidden. They're not, they're not under a rock somewhere. They're in plain sight. Matter of fact, my Bible, it'll, it'll tell you on every page. If, if there's a discrepancy of some, of some kind anywhere, it'll actually list it in what it is. But there are no discrepancies in the Word of God that actually change the full meaning of that Scripture. Zero. Zero. You know what's crazy? If you, if you look at the 37 works by, by Shakespeare... What you're going to find out by the 37 works of Shakespeare that you can't find one of them without, without over a hundred different differences. And these differences actually change the full meaning of what was said. And this is, this is 400 years ago. Like the, the printing press was in operation in the 1600s. These were written like the early, early 1600s. The printing, print, printing press was in, in operation. There was this distribution on, on the, you could massively distribute these. And yet there's all these differences. Why, why was these words, why was four different accounts of the words of one Jewish carpenter who actually changed history? Why are there no differences? And they're thousands of years old. So Sean, why don't they include these in secular history? Why don't you read in your history books and the Gallic Wars say this and Tacitus said this and Matthew said that and John said this and when Luke wrote this, this is, this is how it applies to history. Why isn't it included in secular history? Because, because there, there, is, there, is a, there is an extreme prejudice against anything that is supernatural. So here's, here's kind of how this happens. Well, I'm going to look at these texts. But before I look at these texts, I just want to tell you, I'm not, if there's something supernatural in here, I'm not going to believe it. Okay, just, just so we're clear. And so you start going through the Gospels, you're like, well, cross that out, cross that out, cross that out. Jesus walked on water, healed a guy with blind eyes, he fed the 5,000, cross that out, cross that out. Pretty soon you don't really have much left. You can't go into something reading it with, with a predisposition before you ever get to, to get it. So here's, here's what happens. A different kind of example. I, Sean, I don't believe in the Holocaust. I don't believe it ever existed. Well, why not? I've never seen that kind of racism in my life. The kind of racism that can cause a whole nation, Sean, a whole country, to turn against a race of people and then methodically exterminate them in gas chambers. And Are you serious? I've never seen it. My mom's never seen it. My friends have never seen it. My coworkers have never seen it. I've never seen that kind of racism. I've seen other kinds of racism, but nothing on that level. Therefore, because I, haven't, I, 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 I don't believe it ever happened that way, or I've never seen that kind of racism, 
That kind of racism can't exist because it's not been inside of my experience. Therefore, they're... So, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. There are writings by these people that, in the Holocaust. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't care. Wait, 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 hold on. There's, there was over, there was over 180,000 current survivors in the nation of Israel that have survived the Holocaust. 800 of them that are over 100 years old. That means they were in their 20s when this happened. You want to go talk to them? No, no, I, I don't care. I, I don't believe it. If that happened, I've never seen it. It can't happen. Okay, so, so here, here's another one. I don't believe that the kind of heroism that makes a firefighter run into a flaming building and pull somebody out. I don't believe that that, that actually has ever happened. Well, why not? I've never seen that kind of heroism in my life. I've never once thought I'm going to go into a flaming building and take somebody out and save their life. I've never, I've never done that. I never thought I'm going to do that. My friends haven't done it. My mom hasn't done it. She never lies. My friends have never done it. My coworkers have never seen that kind of courage ever in their life. Therefore, that kind of courage cannot exist because it doesn't exist. And also, here, here's the other thing, Sean. I don't believe that those firefighters actually did that. Your experience does not make something true or not true. You've got to be careful. Your 21st century experience does not make something true or not true. See, God didn't just tell Matthew to write down what he saw. Mark to write down the accounts of Peter, Luke to interview a bunch of eyewitnesses, John to write down what he saw. Listen to what else he, else he did. In his wisdom, God did everything possible, possible to capture actually what happened and then protect it and deliver it to us now 2,000 years ago in a state that we could read what was originally written. You're hard-pressed to find anything else. It even comes close. There is nothing else. Actually, it's been argued this. If you take all first century Roman history and all the writings of such and all the archaeology and pile them up, it doesn't even it, it doesn't even come to a tenth of what the Bible's reliability and historicity is. And these are secular historians. These are not Christian historians. So you have to ask this question: Is it true? What if it's true? What if it's true? Just because I've never seen God do anything doesn't mean that God has never done anything. You see, just because I've never witnessed a miracle, that doesn't mean that God has never done a miracle. Just because I've never seen anyone walk on water doesn't mean that no one's ever done it. Just because I've never seen loaves and fish multiply and feed 5,000 people doesn't mean it never happened. Because we, we want to take our 21st century viewpoint and superimpose it over a book. That if you believe it, it was written by God. Same kind of thinking, guys. It says this. Once the universe wasn't, and then boom, there it is. Okay, all right, all right. Without any kind of creator, no intelligent designer. No, 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 no none of that. And I, I can't believe in a creator or intelligent designer because I don't believe in the supernatural, so... It wasn't, and now everything is. It's the same exact kind of mentality. It strips away the possibility of anything supernatural. I would say this. I'm, I'm coming to a close here. If we walked into a courtroom, okay, if I was on, on trial, what I wouldn't want is the jury to come in and say, you know what, we are going to examine all the evidence with an open heart and open mind. We're going to examine it, and we're going to turn it over, and we're going to look at it, Sean. As long as it doesn't prove your innocence, we're going to totally, like, we're going to, we're going to look at all this evidence. As long as it doesn't prove your innocence. As long as it, we know you're not innocent, so that's the presupposition. We're going to walk in, you're not innocent. So we'll listen to everything, but not that. Is that fair? Is that just? Is that right? Nonetheless, that's how people look at Scriptures, And all I'm trying to say to you here today, what if it's true? Maybe you need to look at the evidence based upon the authority of the evidence alone. And be careful not to impose your 21st century experience on what possibly God has protected and delivered to you. Let's close our eyes. See some manuscripts. They tell not only of a designer and a creator, they also talk about a savior, Christ the Lord. 
Just like the overwhelming evidence in nature that he is alive, he's also preserved the message of forgiveness and reconciliation. See, the point, of, the point of the scriptures, the point of them being preserved, and the point of them being delivered to you isn't just to tell you how wrong you are. Isn't just to keep you from all the things that you want to do. Isn't just to suppress you or oppress you. It's actually the purpose we see in this book over and over and over again is that of freedom. Is that of reconciliation with the Holy God. Is that of of being able to take broken humanity and mend it back together again? Is that of becoming children and sons and daughters of a holy God? The message that was preserved is so beautiful. It's not just laws and rules. It's poetry and it's history, it's philosophy, it's parables of love, and it's it's our right to forgiveness and grace and mercy. It's our place as humanity, like it says in scripture, that we should boldly be able to enter into the throne of grace and receive that which we need in, in a time of trouble. This morning, you might have tuned in, and you may have you may have thought that the whole point of this book and the whole thing we've been talking about today is built upon rules and laws of you being good enough to earn it. And maybe this morning you're seeing Jesus in a new light. Maybe when you ask, who is Jesus, for the first time, you might be saying, I believe the book. I believe that Jesus came to give me grace and grace and mercy. And that while I was a yet sinner, Christ died for me. If you've never asked Jesus into your heart this morning, and accepted him as Lord and Savior, I just want to say, could you say this prayer with me? And say it with the the people that are in this room and, and... Maybe in your room too. And maybe they have accepted Christ. Maybe they've walked away, maybe they've never left. Or maybe you're just in a really good spot with God and you've never had the kind of relationship that you have now with Jesus. But can we just all say this together as believers confirming our faith? Say, Father God, I thank you for giving me your word. It shows me your love. It shows me your grace. It shows me how you want me in your kingdom. And for sending your son to die on the cross for my sins. So that I could spend eternity with you. And Jesus, I thank you for giving your life for mine. And now Jesus, give my life. To you, in Jesus' name, Amen. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you you protected and you preserved, and you delivered this message to us, so that we can know the kind of love and grace that you have. And Father God, help us to give the same grace and mercy and love to those that are in our world. In Jesus' name, Amen. All right, Amen, Amen. Let's give it up for Pastor Sean. I thought that was a great message for who is Jesus. I think my favorite thing about the message uh, that spoke to me in my heart was thinking about how crazy some of the stuff that we read is in the Bible is, you know, and I, I think that that's an obstacle that I come across when trying to tell people that don't know Jesus about Jesus, you know. But when you get to experience that favor and you get to experience that provision and you get to experience those miracles in your own life, then nothing's impossible with God. Amen? So let's just be, let's be the testimony to somebody and be bold in the things that we get to go through, the experiences that we get to have with God through, through the Holy Spirit and just be able to share that.